Hi there, and welcome to the show. This is the Apartment Building Investing Podcast, and I'm your host, Micah Blanc. Really excited you're here. Today on the show, I have with me Mark Dolfini, and he's really passionate about something he calls time wealth. In fact, he talks about it in his new book called The Time Wealthy Investor, uh, available on Amazon. And we talk about the importance because sometimes we're just thinking about generating passive income and we're focused more on the money aspect versus really on what's behind it, which is really controlling our time. So we talk about what that really means about treating your your uh, the activity not so much as a hobby but as a business and making sure you guard against getting too involved in whatever you're doing. If you're flipping a bunch of houses, you get involved in the weeds. If you're doing uh, apartment buildings and you're looking for deals, you're raising money or you're managing hundreds of units, oftentimes you get so caught up and you lose the one thing that you wanted to do in the first place, which was control your time. You really have to be very careful about that. And you have to make sure that you design a vision and a process around that. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about on the show here with Mark Delfini. So let's get right into it. Mark, welcome to the show today. It is great to be here. Well, it's great to be anywhere, but it's certainly great to be here. <laughs> love that. Love that. Love it so much. So give us a little, little background uh, on how you ended up in real estate. You know, I always had an interest in real estate. I remember back when I was, uh, I don't even know, seven or eight years old, um, uh, my dad had asked me specifically what I wanted for Christmas one year, and I said, real estate. <laughs> and he said, why? Yeah, well, and, uh, <laughs> I want a rental property. Right, and, and he... Uh, <laughs> I just thought the idea of owning my own piece of something in America was just a, just a cool idea. Of course, I wanted to build a big fort on it, you know, and being seven or eight years old, and that, that way I could defend it from, you know, from the evil, uh, you know, whatever's that were invading. But it was it was a whole idea of just ownership, which just really was uh, very interesting to me. It, it just captivated me from an early age, and I just love the, the concept of ownership. That's awesome. Uh, and so what, how did you actually get into uh, uh, into real estate? So uh, flash flooring, you know, uh, a few in, into reality about about 15 years. Um, I, uh, I I really got into real estate. My my um, my first go at real estate was actually when I had I had joined the Marine Corps. Um, and while I was in the Marine Corps, I had bought uh, about 40 acres in the middle of nowhere in, in Arizona. And at the time, it was only about $250 an acre. So I figured, you know, it can only go up. And I was right. Um, but that was really my first my first go at it. But um, but while I was, uh, you know, before that, I was I was in high school. I had graduated about 352nd out of about a 354. So uh, needless to say, I didn't really apply myself all that that vigorously. <laughs> But that's an important, you know, it's an important lesson because there are people that I don't want you thinking that you have to have this high pedigree or have to be incredibly intelligent to, to get ahead in this. It's just, it's, it's about, you know, sticking to it and doing the right things. But um, I, I, I went on to 13th grade, which was a community college there in the area. Um, but I realized that I needed my, I needed to get some direction in my life. And uh, it wasn't long after that I joined the Marine Corps and, um, and they jerked my tail pretty straight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, it wasn't too long after that, and you actually started accumulating rental properties. Tell, tell us a little about that. Right. So after I, after I got out of the Marine Corps, I had, um, I did, I joined, I, I, I got out, I decided I needed to get an education, and um, I went to Purdue and got, I went in there for, uh, for hospitality originally, and then I got into uh, doing uh, accounting. I went into the to the accounting program at Purdue. So it was um, not long after that that um, that really I um, I started buying rental properties when I was in the uh, in the accounting program there at Purdue. And by the time I graduated, I actually had about a dozen rental properties altogether. By the time I finished up the the program there at Purdue, so um, that's that's really where my education started. All right. So tell us a little bit about during this time, kind of what went right and maybe uh, what went wrong. Well, at that point in time, I, um, I, when I was buying my rental properties, I pretty much proceeded to make every mistake a person possibly can make in real estate. <laughs> so whether it was, um, 
you know, I, I mean, I got too familiar with my tenants and I didn't, I, I downloaded leases from some place on the internet that I didn't really know and didn't really have a, I, I didn't have any sort of systems in place or I didn't have any screening in place. I mean, I just did all sorts of, I mean, everything that I basically am consulting my people now not to do, uh, I did because uh, I just didn't know any better. I wasn't setting it up like a business and that was really, that was really the problem. So, um, so yeah, I mean, at that point in time, like I said, I had about a dozen rental units after I got out of Purdue as a student. Um, I continued buying properties while I was, uh, while I was um, uh, in my professional career as an accountant. I worked for, uh, I worked for the Marriott for a while. I worked for an accounting firm for a while. And then uh, ultimately I just, I, I got to a point where I, I, I did not like the, the fact that I did not have the ability to control my calendar. And um, so I, you know, um, and in fact, my last job really left me, they, they decided that I was not a good fit for them anymore, which was, you know, it, it, my feelings were hurt for about five minutes. And then I realized that I just had bigger fish to fry with my, with my getting into my own business and, and really being intentional about, about, uh, about growing that. Well, so let's, let's back up just a little bit. You, you had some rental property that were obviously generating income for you. Uh, was the income good? Was, was that not mm -hmm. the, was that the, not the issue? Uh, and, and if, if that wasn't the issue, you talked about time. So what was really the problem with your investment at the time? Well, at that point in time, it really wasn't a problem. I mean, it, it was becoming a problem now that I look back, but that's not really where the problem, the big problems really were happening. I mean, it, the, the, the properties were self-sustaining, right? They, they weren't kicking off a ton of cash for me. I mean, there were some months where I would have you know, an extra couple thousand. And then there was a couple months, you know, there'd be a month where I had to kick in a couple thousand. So it, it, they were basically a wash cash flow wise. They weren't, they weren't terrible, but they weren't, you know, they weren't great either. Um, and most of that is because they were highly leveraged. Um, I, and I, and I was, I mean, but that really wasn't the biggest problem. The biggest problem was the fact that I was doing all this work that, that I was not really compensating myself well enough. And I was, I was the one doing all the doing. So after I had gotten out of that, Whoa. you know, uh, of the professional side of things, I, um, I, after I got outside of the professional side of things, I had basically gotten to where I was growing my business pretty, pretty, um, pretty intentionally. And, um, by the time when I stopped working, I was about 30 units and I got to 92 rental units by myself. So that was about $6 million worth of real estate. All right, so you had grown your portfolio now to 90 houses. That's a lot. Were you self-managing this? Uh, what was going on with the business at the time? Yeah, I was self-managing, and I was doing it horribly. Um, I, I mean, I was. what had happened was I basically, when I was doing, you know, when I had the five units and then 12 units and then 30 and then 45 and et cetera, et cetera, I was the one doing all the doing. I was the one doing all the leasing, all the showings, all the accounting, all the bookkeeping. Um, you know, I was doing, I was doing everything, you know, from uh, rent collections and bookkeeping and accounting and banking and opening the mail and, and collections and everything. So it was, um, you know, I never changed to where I was actually doing, where I ever replaced myself from doing all the labor. I was doing everything. So by the time I got to 92 rental units, I never, I never hired anybody else to do that lower end work. I never valued my time very highly. So um, I just ended up creating a, a job for myself that was the worst job in the world. I mean, it was a job you never got away from. Um, you know, granted, I was bringing in $65,000 a month in rent revenues, but my life was truly the definition of hell. It was, I, I never had any time off and God forbid if anything should ever happen to me where I got sick or anything along those lines, it just, um, I mean, it was just sustainable, but you know, I never, um, you know, I, I never, it never, it never got any better. So, well, what happened then finally? Well, um, so my Jerry Maguire moment came when, uh, I actually, I was, um, you know, Around 2008, um, the economy started to get a little soft. The labor market started to get a little soft. And it was, um, you know, my, my monthly rent revenues came in from about $65,000 a month to about $30,000 a month. And month over month over month. And it was just, it was unsustainable. I mean, it was, it was absolutely crushing. So 
naturally, because my default mode was being, you know, action oriented, I, um, I just worked harder. I worked more. And, um, and that was the, that was the problem is that, you know, I had a good work ethic and I still have a good work ethic, but I didn't recognize it just because I had a good work ethic didn't mean that I should be the one doing all the work that I should be one doing all the, all the things that we're doing. I didn't value my time highly enough. So, um, to answer your question, um, you know, I lost about four and a half million dollars of real estate pretty much overnight. Um, and it was crushing. I lost my house, my car. I mean, all the things that you hear about, you know, when people, when things just go bad. Um, I mean, I, I, it went, it went truly horrible. And on top of that, I mean, I almost died. I actually, actually almost died because I started out, I had a cold and I was working through, I was like, ah, you know, I'll just, you know, work through it and, and get through it. And, and what ended up happening is this simple cold turned into double pneumonia. And the only way that I could actually breathe was to actually slump over a chair um, and, and before I could get to the hospital. And, and in the hospital, I remember very distinctly, um, you know, they put me in a room and said they'd bring me a breathing treatment. And it was a long time before they brought that to me. And I, I, I remember very distinctly thinking this is where I was going to die because I was, I was passing out. And by the time they, they came in, I was, I was already half unconscious. But um, anyway, I mean, I, but at that point in time, that was really the, that was the reset button that, that I needed to realize that I just could not continue on in this madness. I never set this up as a business that was sustainable, um, that would, uh, you know, that could run without my constant intervention. So what, what did you, you mentioned the word intentional um, a lot. What did you realize in the, in the hospital? How, how did you feel like you needed to, to change your life? Uh, if you were to make out of that, what, what happened? Right. Well, what I, what I sat and I, and I realized that my, my business really lacked multiple things. It lacked vision. It lacked intention. It lacked infrastructure. Um, it lacked process. I mean, it really lacked anything that even remotely resembled a business. So when you were, when you look at that, um, you know, I really, I, I never really had a vision for my business other than to just make money and I wanted to make more money. You and I both know now how nonsense that sounds, right? Right. But I mean, you can make more money by getting, you know, getting an extra nickel, but I never had any intention. I never looked at my business as a vessel to get me from here to there. And I just, I just got very, very busy. I was very industrious, but I just wasn't very efficient, certainly not very effective because I didn't have any direction. So I really wanted to establish a clear direction. At this point, my direct, my direction was sheer survival. I just needed to get from, from, I just needed to get solvent. And that was my vision for a long time. So with that vision, right, even though it was just a very simple vision, it was just survival at this point, Otherwise, I was going to have to go back and get a job, which was at that point I was unemployable. I mean, I'd been un, you know, I'd been self-employed for so long, it, it just I was unemployable. Um, but I needed to get from that paradigm of self-employed to business owner, and that self-employed to business owner transition for me was very difficult. It was like watching the Hulk turn back into David Banner because it was just a, rewiring my brain to this new paradigm that. You know, I just because I could do something did not mean it was the highest and best use of my time. So, um, I I I I came up with this system, which is indicated in my book, The Time Wealthy Investor, called VIP, and it's V is the vision. That's where I want to go, and and that's where I came up with that vision. Like, okay, I I know I have a a, a very rudimentary vision in terms of where I want to go. That like I said, it was at that point just solvency. Next, I went to infrastructure. And infrastructure, if you think of infrastructure, it's the bones of a business. It's just like the framework, the skeleton of a, of a building. It's, it's the, the software that your, that your business will run on or, or even the desks and chairs or even the office itself. That's the infrastructure of a business. It's, you know, it's, the, it's the things that, um, that, that you will operate, you know, like, a soft, um, like I said, software or a website, things like that. Those are, that's the basic infrastructure of a business. And then finally was the P, which is, which is the process of the VIP uh, paradigm. It's vision, infrastructure, and process. And process is really about all of your rules upon which you'll operate. And it's the, it's the protocols and the things that you will use to run on the infrastructure that you've built. So 
again, it's it's the it's it's the um, uh, the rules that you'll run on the infrastructure. So if you think of the infrastructure as a set of uh, a set of tracks, process is the train that runs on those tracks. So all right. So you you talk you talk about in your, in your book about you know the, the goal is not to generate amount, large amounts of positive cash flow. It's really creating you know what you call time wealth, which I, which I really like. And the people I, I speak to that come to us and say, hey, I want you know, I, they don't tell me I, I want a million dollars. They say, I want to control my time. That's what they want, right? And, and financial right. freedom helps you control your right. time. So, you know, you're hearing the same, the same thing. Um, now, how did you create time wealth for yourself? How did you apply the VIP process from this realization, from the depths of your misery? Uh, how, how did you, how are you able to apply that <laughs> to, your, uh, to your life? Right, it, it, exactly to your point. So I, I refer to that as life output. So a lot of people, you know, yeah, I, I refer to myself, you know, my business is landlord coach, but really I'm a life coach for property managers and, life, and landlords because it really is about life output. You, no one ever gets into rental properties because they say, yeah, I've got far too much free time on the weekends and I really want to use that to, 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 uh, uh, to not see my friends and family anymore, right? I mean, if you're saying that, then come work for me and you can work for me for free until you stop thinking that way. <laughs> but, but kidding aside, that's, it's really about life output. And for me, it was really about you know, just, just being able to have a Sunday off where my phone didn't ring. And there's so many times where I even had, I mean, I'm a broker, I'm a property manager um, for my own business, but, um, but I, st I, I don't have to do that anymore because I'm not beholden to, um, you know, answering the phone every time it rings. I have systems in place for that. I have people that do that. And it's not always the same person. It rotates. So they have time freedom and they have the ability to control their calendar. So yes, you do need financial wealth to have time wealth, right? I mean, there's lots of homeless people that have ample amounts of time wealth, but they don't have, I mean, maybe they, they, they do have the lifestyle that they want. I, I, I don't know, I can't speak for them. But, but if you want a certain standard of living and you want to be able to enjoy that, you're going to need a certain amount of financial wealth to have time wealth. The, my argument has always been that people, well, not always, but my, my argument has been, you know, once I came to this conclusion was that People spend an awful lot of time aiming at the wrong target, which is financial wealth. And financial wealth is just a means to an end when you're looking at time wealth. Let's talk about transition from you talked about, uh, you know, kind of being self-employed to becoming more of a business owner. It's a different mindset. Now, that transition can be very painful because there's no one in the world that can do as good of a job as you can. Right. And, and so uh, <laughs> putting someone else in place of doing something, uh, be it be a proper manager or, or maybe, you know, even in, in our business, uh, you know, when, when you have a, you know, a few, maybe 100 units, you're still doing, even though you have property managers in place, there's still a lot of stuff around it. Uh, and people have a lot of anxiety around potentially hiring a virtual assistant, for example, uh, that can that can do things at ten, right. twenty dollars an hour. Uh, and, and so talk about the, 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 the shift in mindset because, because now obviously if you hire someone, you're going to make less money. If I self-manage a property, I'm going to make more money. If I do the bookkeeping myself, I'm going to make more money. Uh, but why is that a limiting, not only a limiting belief, but actually a limiting factor in your ability to, to, to grow? That, that's a great question. I'm really glad that you brought it up now because it's really about opportunity cost. Okay. So you know, the, the toughest thing is to learn to value your time, to put a value, a dollar figure on your time. Whereas, you know, it, it, back then, would, would I have gone and fixed someone's washer or dryer for 50 bucks? I probably would have, okay? Would I do that now? I definitely wouldn't because my, my time now is valued in the hundreds of dollars per hour versus the, you know, the $50 per hour, okay? So, so is there, is there, is there times where I'm doing stuff that is certainly less like, you know, uh, you know, answering phone calls and doing those things, which I could easily pay someone to do 10 or $12 an hour for. Sure. But here's the thing. If you're going, if you're going to be willing to do jobs that are, that you could pay someone else to do eight or 10 or $12 an hour for, you got to understand something. That is what you're paying yourself. So if you bought real estate, to make $12 an hour, I'm going to argue that you are, you're, you're, you're not valuing your time highly enough. 
Because if you wanted simply to make 10 or $12 an hour, you can go down to uh, several fast food restaurants, become an assistant manager within six months and make that. And you're probably going to have more time wealth because when you're off work, you're off work, you're done. Like you don't have to manage anything. I mean, you might have to go in and cover a shift every now and again, but you have time wealth. With real estate, if you're the one answering the phone 24/7, now you have to now you have to divide what you're making per month. So let's say you're you know, you're bringing in $300 a month. Now you're having to divide that over every hour in the month because you're the one answering the phone every single time it rings. And sometimes it rings at three in the afternoon, and sometimes it rings at three in the morning. So I, my, my, my argument for that would be you're not valuing your time highly enough. Now, in the beginning, yes, you should be the one doing all the doing because you need to understand what the roles are, what the jobs are, so that when you're training someone, so when you hand it off to someone, you know how to train them. You know what to expect. And if it's like, oh, I only have to pay someone, a virtual assistant, for example, um, you know, I'll give a plug to CC my admin. They only charge when they answer the phone and when they complete the task. So if, they're, if their job is to, you know, granted, they might be 30 or $40 an hour, but if they're answering the phone, hanging up and sending, sending an email to a, or, or calling an HVAC uh, technician for you on your behalf, and that costs $6, um, I would pay $6 to not be interrupted in the middle of the night. I mean, I think most people should think that way too. And so that's where, that's where you really have to start valuing the, the, the value of your free time and think of the opportunity cost in terms of what it is actually that, uh, that you, what you could be making and, and what you could be paying someone else. You talked about the, the value of time and opportunity cost. Can we, let's see if we can make it a little more tangible. This is a really good exercise. Number one, how does someone uh, determine the value of their time? And number two, how can someone in their mind justify hiring someone in terms of their opportunity cost? In other words, if they weren't doing this particular activity, let's say it's bookkeeping or something, how else could they be using their time? So those two questions, um, you know, how do I how do I know what I'm worth per hour, and 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 how can right. someone uh, this how can someone determine what they could be doing if they weren't doing this particular you know lower wage activity? Right. The best way to value your time, ser re realistically, especially if you're not doing this, if you're doing just this right now, it's a little bit more difficult. But for most people, especially people who are just starting out, um, it's you know, what are you making at work right now? Are you making $10 an hour or $20 an hour or 30,000 per year or 50,000 per year? What are you making right now? And divide that out to the number, number of hours you're working, including travel time. So there's times where you're traveling and not getting paid, right? So the, the 30 minute commute to work or hour, or if you're in Manhattan, you know, sometimes two hours, you know, in one direction, you know, so you may have four hours of travel time that you're not even being compensated for. So all of that work activity, including stuff that you're doing at home, divide all that out. What are you making per hour? Now, if you're self-employed, now for me, in that, pati that particular instance, I had, a, I had a side hustle that I was doing. I was repairing washers and dryers and stuff like that because I'm actually fairly handy when it comes to that. And I, was, I, was, uh, I think my billing rate at the time was $25 an hour. So if I was doing activity like cleaning that I would pay someone $8 an hour to do, it, I mean, I was losing $17 an hour every time I was doing that activity. So in, in the particular case where you've got, um, you know, where you've got a, a, an individual who's, you know, maybe, maybe earning $20 an hour at their job, you really have to consider, okay, fine. Maybe you're willing to take on that, you know, 12 or 13 or $14 hour dollar an hour job, you know, to, to do some painting. Um, but you're going to, you're going to learn about it, but you're going to try to get someone out of that as quick as possible. You know, should you be the one opening the mail? Should you be the one going to the post office? Um, should you be the one doing, I mean, those are the sorts of things where you need to value your time and you can get out of that, that mindset pretty quickly. You want to fire yourself as fast as you can from that job. So otherwise you just create another job for yourself and you'd be better off. You'd have more time wealth if you just worked a part-time job or maybe picked up overtime at your current, at your current, uh, at your current job. So those are the sorts of things that, that that's that mindset that you really need to get into. So you're not um, continuing to just shovel more coal into the into the locomotive for lack of anything else better to do. So, so that's, that's a great example of how you value your time. And the other way I like to think of it is if you weren't just doing this one particular activity, what else could you or should you be using your time for? And, and, you know, in our world, the multifamily syndication, the two really high value 
uses of your time is finding deals and raising money, right? And, and really anything that you're not doing related to that is, is really time away from those two activities. So a lot of people get stuck in the, in the rat hole of day-to-day -day operations. Uh, you know, for example, thing that will suck up your, your, your time is, you know, is you know, things like bookkeeping or, or paying certain invoices um, you know, certain things like, like that, when it might take you an hour or two or three, even a week, just doing that kind of stuff versus, you know, meeting, uh, an investor meeting, for example. I mean, every time you buy a deal, if it's a house flip, for example, you make $30,000 per house flip, or you have a, a $75,000 acquisition fee on a multifamily. Every time you do a deal or you raise money, you make way, way, way more money than the $20 an hour you might be paying a bookkeeper. Um, and, and that's the way I like to think of it. Exactly. Yep. But no, but, I, absolutely. I mean, you, you, yeah, but it's still one of those things where if I hire a bookkeeper for five hours a week at 20 bucks an hour, that's a hundred dollars a week, $400, you know, a month, that's a lot of money. Uh, and, 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 and oftentimes I found when I've hired someone, it's a lot of money to me and I feel very uncomfortable in bringing on a virtual assistant or a second one or someone helping me do this or the, the other thing. And I've always found that I'm very uncomfortable doing that. And I'm uncomfortable for like the first three weeks and all of a sudden, uh, it frees up my time and I'm like, holy cow, I can actually yeah. make five more phone calls because of that. And I raised $500,000 because of that. And you trace it back to those things and it's, it's mind opening. And, and, and everyone I talk to about, you know, going from a, a, a one person uh, operator to having people on your team and achieving scale, that's the thing that holds people back. So I think it's a really good point you make is that the time wealth, really, you have to value your time to figure out what you're worth and what can you delegate even if it's uncomfortable uh in in the beginning so i love that i love that right and just because you yeah yeah and just because you delegate something doesn't mean that you can't take it back i mean okay. like for example i recently I, I spend a fair amount of time in, in in indianapolis and i live about an hour away um a little bit more than an hour about an hour and 15 minutes away well it was i was getting almost two and a half to three hours of windshield time per per day if I was driving back and forth to Indianapolis. So I thought about it and I thought, you know what, maybe I should look at getting a driver. And I was thinking that sounds so pretentious. Like just, no, I don't really need a, that's ridiculous. And you know what? There's a retired guy sitting at home, you know, spending every day trying not to get stabbed by his wife because he's retired, you know, driving her crazy. So it gets him out of the house where now he gets to, he gets to make, 50 or hundred bucks a day, you know, driving, but I'm getting three hours back now. I mean, again, like I said, if my time is hundred dollars an hour, I'm already $250 an hour, hour or $250 ahead per day, just from having him do that. And he loves it. He loves it. He's out driving me around and, and, and that just works for me. So, and, and it works for him. So yes, you, when you look at cost, absolutely. But it's, it's one of those things where you have to look at value so yeah, I, you're, you're, you're totally right about that. I think, uh, I think a lot of people underestimate the time value that they have. And the thing is that happens at multiple parts of the, of, of the business. So for example, you know, one of the reasons that I like multifamily is because I feel like I, uh, the, the, the single family is, is too much work. And so maybe now I, I, I graduate to multifamily and I'm able to put a property manager in place so that I have to do less work. But I also see it now at the, at the next level. So let's say you, you successfully make the traditional multifamily, which is great, and you, uh, you do three or four deals and you have three, 400 units in place. And now what I'm seeing now is, is people that are doing that, now they're stuck at a different level. Uh, uh, and now they're doing all of the asset management yourself. And I keep bringing up bookkeeping and stuff like that because, you know, that's, that's stuff that I have to deal with. But, but now they're doing things like uh, investor reporting and, 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 and bookkeeping and, and doing that kind of stuff that a lot of the stuff can be delegated to a good virtual assistant at $20 an hour to extract uh, the appropriate data, filing reports, putting the other reports together. And this might take, you know, a couple, three hours per week. And, you know, why not hire a virtual assistant for that activity, freeing up the syndicator to look for more deals and raise more money. So it, it happens at multiple, at multiple levels. And that mindset, for some reason, even though you learn it once, still is there some, sometimes. And it, it kind of boggles, boggles my mind. But, but my point is what you're, what you're saying is really relevant to, uh, to regardless of where they are in their, in their business. And even though they might have learned a lesson at one point, they might still get hung up from a mindset perspective uh, down the road. So, so I love that. And um, yeah, so, uh, so you obviously very, you feel very passionate about this topic of, of time wealth. In fact, you, you wrote a, a book about it 
called The Time Wealthy Investor, uh, Your Real Estate Roadmap to Owning More, Working Less, and Creating a Life You Want. So I love this, I love this topic uh, and I appreciate you sharing it because a lot of times we get this idea that we want to become real, real estate investors and when we finally do it and we check the box, we realize that, my gosh, we swap one job for another. When that's not really, exactly. and that's not really what we want. We really want to control our time. So when people are sitting there in their cubicle going, oh, this sucks, I want to become a real estate investor, maybe they're not being intentional enough about their vision. I would absolutely agree with that. I think that really what they end up doing is they, they end up swapping their time for money. And this is really, you know, whenever I have this conversation early on with people that are saying, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a house flipper or I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a wholesaler or whatever they do because they, they maybe want to get rental properties down the road. But I, I don't care what you do. I mean, I'm a, realist, I'm a buy and hold guy. I always have been. I, I, I've done a couple of flips. Just, you know, I mean, if the opportunities are there. But realistically, I don't care what you do as long as you set it up so you're not doing all the doing. Where I've got these, you know, these people who are doing these these flips. If you're doing it because you enjoy that side of things, that's fantastic. But the minute you start to become the bottleneck, that's the problem. Where you know, there's there's a guy I ran across the other day, and um, you know, he he said to me, "Well, I'm just really not sure if I should hire someone to do to finish the renovation of the house." I said, "Oh, well, how much is that going to cost?" And he said, "Well, about fifteen thousand. And I was like. Okay. I mean, he bought the house for 30 and he didn't want to put 15 in, into it. I said, well, what would you normally rent it for? He says, probably about 750, you know, 800 in, in a good market. I said, okay. How long has it been vacant? Two years. <laughs> so the math there was pretty simple, but the fact is he was so, like I said, I mean, this guy's got a good work ethic, but just because you got a good work ethic does not mean you, that you should be the one doing all the work. You need to be, you're, you're going to become the bottleneck in some way, you know, where even if it's just a simple task like writing checks, okay, fine, but someone else can write the checks and you can sign them. You can, you're still getting the same, the same product. You're still getting the same, uh, the same check and balance there. So, I mean, there's lots of things that you can think of if, if you can be, um, you know, if you have a mentor or a, or a coach or someone that you work with, they can easily point out that the, the areas where the bottleneck is, or you may not be able to see it because you're the one too busy putting out fires. You're the one too busy stuck in the forest. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so the goal should not be, I am on, I want to become a real estate investor. That, that's not the goal. That's, that's the, the vehicle perhaps, but the goal is time. Right. And yeah, so it's a great reminder. And I see this all the time. If people are going to the RIA meetings and they come there every, every week and they're like, oh, I want to be a real estate, estate investor. I'm like, really? Is that is that really what you want? You know, imagine if you become a real, <laughs> imagine you become a, a real estate investor like like Mark did, right? <laughs> you know, uh, and you've you've succeeded, right? Have you really succeeded? Have you really thought this through? And I'm finding that most people don't think this through. They don't they don't have their their intentions, their their vision right. So, um, and right. and now you're you're coming out with a with another book. Can you can you talk about that uh, briefly? Yeah. Yeah, actually, I, I released it uh, just not very long ago. It's a, a brand new book called The Judge, um, and it's it's really just it's a it's a short story. It's a short book. It's only eighty pages. It's meant to really give um, uh, really give people just a kind of a an injection of what time wealth um, could look like in their life, and 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 what time weariness looks like. Mm. And it's it's a it's written as a fable. It's meant to be a quick story. If you if you're go on flights. You can probably read it in a flight. Um, uh, but, uh, but it's already on Amazon, uh, for sale. However, it is, uh, it is available for free download to your listeners. So I'd be, I'd be happy to share that with them. That's awesome. Please share away. We love free stuff, okay. especially stuff that'll make us a better, a better person. Right. It's, uh, it's available at, um, landlordcoach.com forward slash Michael. All right, landlord coach uh, for slash Michael. So, guess definitely check yep. that out. It's, it reminds me of like the one minute one minute manager, you know, in a, in a box, and reminding us about it, the value of uh, of our time, which we oftentimes forget. Right, and it's and it's written like that. I mean, it's meant to be. It gives a couple of really good nuggets, written like a story, um, and it's available for free download, like I said. And there's you'll you'll also uh, have some access to some videos on there, which will explain the VIP process. 
um, really in terms of what it looks like, a little bit of uh, tips on implementation. So there's some good nuggets in there for your for your listeners. Well, listen, I appreciate you making that available uh, for free to listeners. So you guys uh, go to the landlordcoach.com forward slash Michael and grab his e- free ebook um, while it lasts. Um, <laughs> Mark, Mark, how do people connect with you? Uh, the best way I'd love to love to connect with people on Facebook. Um, uh, it's simply Landlord Coach um, on uh, on Facebook. Uh, also, LandlordCoach.com. You can you can uh, if you'd like to have a, a free thirty minute session. I'm I'm offering that as well. There's uh, there's just lots of different ways to connect with me. Those are probably two of the best ways. LinkedIn, of course, um, I'm on there. But uh, love to love to see people on Facebook. And um, I, I put out some uh, videos every now and again just to help people remind them what time wealth is. And uh, I, I, this is a real passion for me because we only get so many spins on this rock. And, you know, and I hate to think that people are spending it doing things that they don't enjoy and, and not to be become, become uh, beholden to income generation and about creating a life that they want. So this is a real passion for me and about helping people a- obtain as much control over their calendar as they possibly can, get to some financial freedom, but specifically get to time wealth. Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, reminder, Mark. That uh, we need to we need time to to spend on things that matter uh, and not get bogged down with things maybe that matter a little less. So I really appreciate you uh, reminding us on the show. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been my pleasure, and thanks again. And uh, and look look forward to seeing you down the road. All right, guys. I hope that was a timely reminder to really focus on what matters most. We're all given the same amount of time. Uh, to accomplish things in life. And sometimes we just get bogged down in things that don't matter as much. And sometimes we don't really have a choice. So sometimes we don't think we have a choice. And we really need to create a a vision around the life that we want. And when we do things, I find that a lot of times most people really don't think about the things they do and the decisions that they make. And we tend to just drift through life. We go through life without really thinking about things because we do the things that are easy well, do we do the things that everybody else around us are, are doing without actually sitting them out and think about, hey, what do I really want in life? And how do I architect that? Now, clearly you don't control everything in life, but, but there are certain things through certain decisions that, that we can architect the life that we want. And the guests on, this, on these podcasts are, are a constant reminder that that is, that is the case. And sometimes it requires you know, a traumatic experience like Mark, Mark had, um, just to rattle your cage and come, hey guys, you know, your time is limited here. Why are we wasting our time doing this particular thing? What can we do to free up our time so we can do things that are just more meaningful to us and to others? So it's a great reminder. Definitely check out his his book uh, around time wealth and definitely grab his uh, his free ebook, The, the Judge. It's a, it's a great little short story about uh, about the value of time. So you can get that at the Landlord Coach, landlordcoach.com forward slash Michael. And um, Mark, thanks again for making that available to, to the listeners here. So I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, if you haven't done so already, grab my free book as well. Uh, it's, it's not a fable. It's a little more serious about raising money to buy your first apartment building deal. So if you want to get into apartment buildings so that you can create time wealth, Hop on over to themichaelblank.com forward slash ebook and you know, spend some time on the website. Uh, I have tons of podcasts and blog articles and YouTube channel and a, a variety of free resources to help you decide if multifamily is right for you. And if it is, then spend some more time on there. Educate yourself. Uh, the good news about multifamily is you can actually use it. Uh, it's the best tool I know. And I've done I've done all kinds of stuff uh, in real estate, non real estate. I've done restaurants. I've done I flipped houses. I've traded stocks and options. And I've done multifamily, and, and the one business that uh, most most efficiently allows you to quit your job and and create financial freedom is multifamily, just without question. Uh, in fact, it's uh, it it is so um, it, it is so reliable that I'm putting out a book called Financial Freedom with Real Estate Investing, and uh, it's coming out right around now. So head on over to Financial Freedom the book, Financial Freedom the book. And you can learn all about my new book. It's my first book I've, I've written, and it's a substantive book. It's not a short little read. It's uh, it's huge. It's a it's a and it really uh, it really is about shifting your mind about what you think about real estate investing. And most people think single family houses. You know, let me do that five or ten years, get some experience, and roll the money into eventually multifamily. And the truth is, you don't need to do any of that. And I, I, I want to shortcut your path of where you want to go, which is financial freedom. And the good news is with multifamily, you don't need experience and you don't need the money either. 
because you can overcome the experience with, with education and you can overcome the lack of money by raising it. So I talk about all that in the book. So head on over to financialfreedomthebook.com. And the cool thing about it is uh, there's so much information I wanted to put in the book and I didn't put it all in there because I didn't want to overwhelm you. But there's a free companion course that comes with a book as well that you can get free access to. You got to get to the book though to, 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 to get that. But it comes with downloadable templates and checklists and other videos of stuff that you really tactical stuff. And the book is a, is a high-level strategy mindset one, but I do spend a good amount of, of, of time on the actual strategy of implementing the things that I talk about. And then it's complemented with a companion course. So check it out. Really proud of it. And I uh, hope you check it out be on Amazon as well. Financialfreedomthebook.com. I really appreciate you guys listening here to the show. Hope you found it inspiring. And I will catch you on the next episode. Hey, thanks so much for sticking around to the end of the video. I want to leave you with three next things to do. I'll give you a quick tour of those and I'll tell you how to do them. Step number one is to download my free ebook, The Secret to Raising Money to Buy Your First Apartment Building Deal. It is an awesome ebook full of tips for raising money and how to do that. So that's number one. Number two is to subscribe to my YouTube channel because I put out new videos all the time and I'd hate for you to miss it. And number three is to watch the next video in line. All right, so what you're going to do is you're going to click on the first thing, which is to download the ebook. That'll open up a new tab. The video will stop playing. You're going to get the ebook and then go back to this video and then click on number two, right, which is to subscribe on the channel. That'll open a new tab. And then you can go back to the third one and just click on the next uh, video in line. All right, so hope you find that helpful and I'll see you in the next video.